All right, so good morning, good evening, everyone. I don't think it's afternoon for anyone here, uh, but it might be when we're done. Um, so uh, I just wanted to start first by acknowledging the situation in Afghanistan. I know that a lot of us have been following what's going on there. Um, and uh, I think that there are people in our community who are directly uh, and indirectly affected and uh, Maybe there isn't that much that we can do, although if uh, anyone here has uh, ideas, please let us know. I just wanted to start by uh, acknowledging that. So uh, today um, is our first open work meeting after we did the handover in July. And uh, I just wanna mention that this is a uh, a new model that we're trying. So uh, there might be things here and there that we need to kind of iron out. And so please be patient. Uh, we are going to be recording these meetings and we're going to be sharing uh, the recording as well. And, and then uh, we'll have notes to, to go with that. So this is what we'll be doing on a, um, uh, on a monthly basis. And uh, it's, it's sort of what we've been doing with the equity talks, if you've noted. Um, so basically that model of sharing uh, the video and the, uh, with captions, uh, if we have any accessibility needs that, would, uh, that we've been asked to address uh, before the meeting, then we will do our best to address them. And uh, we'll be sharing uh, notes and video uh, after the fact. So uh, for today, we'll begin with a discussion on open meetings and our code of conduct. And I've shared a document, which I'll also drop the link for, or um, if someone else has it handy, if you can share it now, that would be great while I just go over the agenda. Um, so uh, uh, we'll go over the document. I'll just give everybody five minutes to, to look it over. And then we can discuss that. We can discuss the code of conduct. And then um, after that, we'll hear about the budget from Andrew. So uh, Andrew is our VP for finances and also has been engaging with the budget since he was uh, interim VP for conferences in the former EC. Um, and I think this, you know, uh, we could all use some help with just demystifying the budget, budget codes, et cetera. And so it's, uh, I think it's gonna take more than one 15 minute session, but it's a start. Uh, and then we have an update from Olivier, which is um, about our committee on HCI education and what they've been working on, what the committee looks like, uh, and how the EC can better support it. And we'll also be doing this in future meetings, just uh, inviting uh, some of our committees to come in and share uh, updates. And this is uh, as much for the EC as it is for sharing with the community. And then in the end, I'll go over some miscellaneous updates. So just things that have been cropping up in recent weeks that we will need to discuss as a team. Um, not so much for discussion really, but just to kind of tell people what's going on. And um, uh, after the 60 minutes of the open session, we're gonna have a working session that's 30 minutes. And that's basically when we'll be doing some of the uh, discussion. But these are again, more for like brainstorming ideation, uh, you know, conversations. So that, uh, that part of the uh, session will be closed. So this is the model that we're trying out for now and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So before we get started for the day, I'd like uh, everyone here to maybe just do a quick 10 second um, intro, but we do have two new members that I can see here, um, uh, two new additions to the EC. So please take longer than 10 seconds, just go over uh, <laughs> uh, who who you are, what your role is in like real life on the EC, what your big hopes and dreams are. Uh, and uh, yes, we'd like to get to know you better. Well, some of us already do and the others would also. Um, so, okay. So with that, let me just uh, get us started with the intros. How about we begin with Josh? Hello, hey everyone. I'm really excited about this role and the opportunity to work with you all. I have already made a few of you in my involvement with the different committees and for those of you that I haven't met yet, I think it will be great to get to know you as we work together. 
As for interest, I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Cybernetics at the Australian National University. And I've been involved with different Zoom committees such as CHI, CHI Play, DIS, DI. And there are a few more details on the blog post about me. I assume most of us read the blog post. So what I proposed for my term with a little bit of data collection that I've done so far are four things. The first one is increase the number of applications for underrepresented areas of the world. Number two, streamline the application and nomination process. Number three, offer the various award boards an iterative review process with feedback for the final candidates. And last, explore knowledge transfer opportunities for awardees to the broader community. What I'm planning to do over the next few weeks or months is to get to know the different award boards, see how we can support them, learn from them, see who's rolling, who is staying, and probably bring new board members with their approval and make sure that is balanced and all of those things that are very important for the awards, I call it award systems, because I wanna see what is the relationship applying the cybernetic thinking that I've been deeply embedded in the last month to think about what is that relationship between people, technology and the environment and how they're interconnected. And that's it for me. I'm happy to talk about anything else, ask me any questions. I'm reachable in email, Slack. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Josh. And Tash, would you like to go next? Yeah. Yeah, hi everyone. Nice to see you all. I'm Cash, he, him. Um, research scientist here at Facebook Reality Labs. I just moved one month ago to Seattle, so I'm new in this area. If you're around, give me a shout out. Um, I'm taking over the role of, or I have taken over the role of VP of Operations, stepping into the big shoes of Eamon, who has done a great job so far. And I have also been a part of that committee in the past couple of years as a member of the video ops team. So I am somewhat familiar with what's, what comes around and goes under the operations role. And I think I've spoken to some or many of you in some capacity there as well, related to captioning or other tools, Discord and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to take over this role. And um, I think one of the main things that comes under the operations uh, VP's task is to make sure everything continues running smoothly. All our infrastructure is well managed. Um, things like our mailing lists, members on our Slack channels and all the other um, mostly software architect uh, infrastructure, things like the Koala and the P uh, progressive web app, they run well and steadily improve over time. We have been adding features features over time, for example, the gallery feature that was uh, recently launched just after Kai, and just looking into how those can be expanded in the future to accommodate the needs of different conferences or events even. Um, and I think one of the big things that we'd like to work towards in the next few years is to establish um, good working models for hybrid conferences, how we can support that um, from the operations side as well working together with, um, for example, the VP of conferences, especially, and taking that forward. So yeah, I'm excited to um, take on some of these tasks and have discussions around them and also get around implementing these ideas then. Thank you, Cash. And uh, maybe we can just do quick intros, just mention your name, your role, uh, pronouns, uh, if you want to mention your your real job, please go ahead. So uh, I realized that I didn't do that. So my name is Neha Kumar, pronouns she, her, I'm uh, president. And let me, and in my day job, I'm uh, associate professor at Georgia Tech uh, and our semester is starting next week and we don't have masks and uh, vaccines mandated. So we will see how that goes. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Regan. Hi, everyone. I'm Regan Mandrick, and I'm she, her. I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. And I'm, well, I don't know what I am. I was the AC for CHI, so I'm chair of the CHI steering committee. Um, 
And uh, before, like in the previous EC, that was a role on the EC. We're still figuring out what that relationship will look like moving forward. But I wanted to say that I'm really excited about this group of people. Um, I'm familiar with uh, all of your work and I know some of you. And so I'm really excited about this group moving forward. Um, that's basically my hopes and dreams is this group right now because we also have our term starting soon. And so I don't remember what my other hopes and dreams are at this point in time. And I will pass it to Andrew. Thanks, Regan. Uh, Andrew Kuhn, I'm uh, the um, Vice President for Finances, and I'm at the University of New Hampshire, otherwise Professor of Electrical Computer Engineering, and I'll pass it to Naomi. Hello, I'm Naomi Yamashita, um, pronoun she, her. Um, I'm the new VP at large with Adriana. Um, I just got my second vaccine the day before yesterday, and I was having downtime yesterday, but I'm recovering. Um, yeah, my real job is um, a primary res researcher at NTT Research Labs in Japan. Thank you. Um, Adriana, want to go next? Yes, thank you. So I'm Adriana Vivacqua, and I am uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro professor. And I'm VP at large. And I also got my second shot the day before yesterday. So how's that for a coincidence or two VP at large? Uh, it's a guy get, got, getting their second shots the same day. And I will pass it on to Shawan. Hello, Shawan Bartel, pronouns she, her. Uh, I'm an uh, executive vice president uh, on the Sika Executive Committee. I'm also a professor um, at the Penn State College of Information Sciences and Technology. I'll pass this on to Tammy. Hi, everybody. I'm Tammy Clegg. I um, am the VP of Membership and Communication, and I am an associate professor at the University of Maryland's iSchool. And I will pass it to Stacy. Hi there, I'm Stacy Branham. I am an assistant professor at the University of California, Irvine. That's my day job. And here on the SIGCHI EC, I get to actually practice what I theorize. I am the AC for accessibility. So we get to try to make SIGCHI accessible for people with disabilities. And I'm wondering who to pass it off to next. Is there anyone? Naomi Wind, I think, right? Uh, Olivier? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Olivier St. Cyr. I'm, um, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I am an assistant professor teaching stream at the University of Toronto in Canada as well. Uh, semester is starting in two, three weeks. So when we're still not sure what's going to happen, <laughs> whether we're going to have mandated vaccines or not, or this and that in person online. So lots of uncertainty right now. Um, this is the, my first time attending one of those meetings, but I'm the chair of the um, HCI Education Committee, and I've also been running EDUCHI for the past four years. Funny fact, uh, Reagan and I were student volunteer at CHI 2001 in Seattle. Thank you. And can we hear from you, Christy? Let's see. Christy, maybe? No, I think it's, yeah, yeah Christy. Yes, I'm here. I'm in the background. Um, my name's Christy Audette, and I am the project manager for SIGCHI, um, carving my way through what we are doing here. I love working with this group of folks. This is my day job. Um, so I'm really happy to be supporting all of you. and. I just am constantly amazed and in awe of the dedication that you all show in your um, commitment to the community of Sinkai. So I'm happy to be here and my pronouns are she, her, and thank you for having me. Thank you. And we have um, one member here, I think from the accessibility committee, no? Uh, Emeline, would, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? I don't know if you want to unmute. Uh, sure. Um, hi. Sorry, I didn't show you camera before. Um, uh, I'm Emeline. I'm a member of the uh, accessibility committee that Stacy has been uh, wonderfully coordinating. I don't know how she does it, but we receive emails at all times of the day. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm a lecturer at University of Sussex, and I was just like, curious about what goes on in, in the AEC. 
uh, meeting. Uh, other than that, I've just been, uh, I'm social media chair here, website chair there, and, and so on and so on. So I try to be as involved as I can uh, in uh, CKI conferences, right? And I use any pronouns. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so we can jump into our next agenda item. Uh, and I think we'll manage to catch up on time. So I shared the, uh, the document that I wanted to go over. And this is the meeting protocol and the code of conduct. And I figured that this was important to kind of get on the same page about. So these are conversations we've been having for the past one, one and a half months. And I just wanted to write down everything that I could remember in terms of the things that we had discussed and just see if this sounds good to people. So there isn't anything in particular that I wanted you know, I was thinking that we would have feedback or discussion on, but I'll just go over some of the bigger points here. So uh, under scheduling, you'll see mainly what this is about is to say that uh, meetings are not mandatory. We would like folks to come, we, especially if you're presenting, but if you cannot, and especially if you cannot because it doesn't, you know, it's not at a time that you're well or you're awake or coherent, then please skip the meeting. Uh, for those of you who are uh, attending and, you know, when you're attending, there's the meeting preferences survey, which was basically to understand kind of how you work. And so are you uh, a night owl? Are you, you know, much more likely to kind of attend meetings when we have them out of work hours? So what works better for you? And these are different for different people. So it's been uh, eye opening, actually, to see what people have been sharing on that. And Christy and I kind of went through it last week and we just made uh, uh, we kept record of, of the constraints that everyone had shared on a spreadsheet. So this is not necessarily for everyone's uh, consumption or understanding, but just for us to be sure that uh, we're trying to accommodate as many folks as possible. So those are general meeting preferences. And then we also wanted to just understand uh, clear, like hard constraints. Uh, and that was with the when to meet links for the upcoming EC meeting. So I know it's gonna be a little bit of labor, um, but uh, the reason that I flipped it around, so it's basically to say when you cannot need a meeting as opposed to um, when you can. And so hopefully uh, that's easier um, to fill out. Um, with regards to um, quarterly meetings, these have been in the past in person and for two and a half days. We're not likely to do them anytime soon in person. And so we've been trying different models over the past year on just how to do these. And uh, uh, I'm curious to see what the survey says, whether people would prefer to do these over a period of time or do them in a much more condensed uh, period of time. So that's something that feedback would be helpful on because we're gonna be doing the first one of these in October. And then I mentioned meeting karma, but when uh, Pageman read this, he said, this sounds like we're gamifying things and, uh, and said that he didn't want us to be doing that, which was surprising. I thought he would, but uh, uh, yeah, he uh, suggested that we, uh, we don't gamify. And uh, it's just kind of an informal way of saying that, you know, if you haven't attended too many meetings, we really want to make sure that you can, right? Because it just doesn't seem fair for, for people for the timing to not work out especially if you've indicated your preferences. So we'll just be trying to do as much as we can there, to be fair. Um, with regards to communicating, uh, maybe the one thing that we're trying to implement, or at least um, uh, a bunch of us have been trying, is to uh, switch over um, to UTC as a time zone. And I think that this requires maybe all of us to do math as we go back and forth. But uh, hopefully we'll get used to it. And so uh, that's one conversation we had with Cash about the uh, website to try and uh, change that um, to UTC as well so that we don't have the times on the Sikai calendar show up all in Eastern time. Um, but that's also open for discussion if you have any strong feelings about that. Um, and then just letting people know uh, in the community, and this is really for uh, Tammy to fine tune. I kind of just noted down a few things, but just in, you know, how would we like to let people know about the meetings, both before the meetings and then after the meetings are done, like how do we report back? Um, 
with regards to participation, uh, so we want to do open meetings and we want uh, people to know what was going on in these meetings. Uh, people are welcome to attend, especially from our committees. I'm really glad that Emmeline is here. And I think we'd like for, for other committee members also, if they're interested to come in and just see the things that we talk about, the discussions that we have. Um, and then to prevent Zoom bombing, we talked a little bit about that. So the rest of the points you see under participating are probably about just how to manage this logistically. And we'll probably have to see how this goes with more meetings. Okay, so then under reporting, uh, if you saw the EC handover notes, um, it's, and, and then as I mentioned, other equity talk summaries, then that was kind of what I was thinking that we would just report back high level points of what was uh, going on. This is something um, that we've been aspiring to do for a while. Uh, and then the notes will be emailed to the members and shared on our blog and website. Okay, so with regards to um, preparing for the meeting, this is also something that there could be suggestions on. So uh, doing overviews of various focus areas uh, with others on uh, BEC. So uh, Andrew's doing <clears throat> this this week. Uh, Helena was also going to be doing a discussion on uh, volunteering and um, the ACM violations database, and that's something she'll do in the next meeting. And then uh, we'll be hearing from Susanna about her vision for, for conferences. So these are the kind of 15 minute updates we would have about people's areas and just what they're planning to do. I think Josh is also gonna do one of these with awards as we get the ball rolling. Um, and then presentations by committees of the EC, and there are a number of these. Um, and then discussion brainstorming sessions, for instance, uh, like this one, if, if there is any feedback. And then um, uh, I think that's basically, and then miscellaneous updates, which we'll do at the end, uh, plus the Q&A. But if there are things that need to be added, uh, feel free to, to put them in the document as a comment or add to the chat. And then we have the saving the date section, which is the when to meet links, which I think we still need people to fill out so that we can plan for the September meeting. And the reason the September meeting is in the, the final week of September is so that we can welcome our new adjunct chairs uh, in, that, uh, um, in that time frame, I think we would be done with our uh, current open calls. Um, and actually, can I ask someone to just share the link to the open calls as well, the ones that are current? Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, with regards to the code of conduct, now uh, I wanted to just acknowledge that this is uh, based on Kale Passmore's code of conduct that we were using um, for the equity talk. Some of it obviously has been adapted for our meetings, but basically uh, with regards to, to moderation so far, um, I'm moderating. This doesn't always have to be the case. If there are people who feel passionately about moderating, if there are people who want to just moderate one meeting, if uh, if I'm not around, if Shawen is moderating, that's uh, you can replace moderator with basically that person. Um, with regards to the the check in. Um, we want to make sure that people know what's going to happen at the meeting, that if they're concerned about something, they can let us know beforehand. The session is going to be recorded <clears throat> for um, the first 60 minutes. And uh, in that time, we ask that people consent <clears throat> to any participation being recorded. And this includes what is posted to the chat. Um, with regards to the, uh, the presentation, um, we encourage you to uh, mention your <clears throat> your name each time you speak along with uh, pronouns. Uh, this is uh, not required, just encouraged. And then with regards to content, uh, try to keep your com comments concise. Uh, do not use, post or discuss potentially harmful content. We encourage constructive criticism and critique. Um, and most importantly, um, under supportive space, you'll see that we do ask people to be patient, to be sensitive uh, to what is being shared. 
people's lived experiences are not for debate, uh, their ideas, policies, and suggestions are. So these are things we'd like us all to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, and uh, in the event of harassment or discrimination, or just any kind of discomfort that you experience um, on account of another attendee or presenter, please message the moderator in today's meeting. That would be me. Um, and that's it. So that's the, uh, you know, the, I'm gonna share the link again, because I saw that Finda just joined. Um, so this is the meeting protocol, the, the code of conduct. Any thoughts on, um, on this? Any questions, anything to add? I'm completely happy for us to move forward uh, without further discussion. I thought it was important to just go over it in the first meeting so that we know kind of what's going on. And we know that uh, also that this is a new format for us. So we're just testing things out um, and we'll see if there are new things that come up or new concerns that come up. Uh, I, I would say that the most important thing for us is to make sure that these, these meetings are open and people can, um, come in and join and listen whenever they want. Uh, but also uh, uh, it is important for um, all members to feel safe, to feel like they can share what they want and that this is gonna be a safe space. Um, and uh, if, if at all there is something that you need to have discussed um, and you, you'd like to request that we turn off the recording and do kind of an ex executive session, then we can also do that in the first 60 minutes. Um, this is not off the table, though I haven't mentioned it in the document here. So if, um, one thing, you know, quickly, mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, yes, about the recordings of the meetings and posting them online. I was just wondering, is that a plan to so consistently make these recordings public? Because of course that has additional overhead in terms of effort and cost, or whether it's just for our archival purposes, um, because of course posting them to YouTube means we need to get it captioned through T-Play Media and then someone needs to do that. And that costs of course money and someone needs to take care of that. So I'm wondering, is that something that's required if there's not like public demand for it as such. So if it's an on-demand on basis, then it can be unlisted, of course, and that does not require them to be professionally captioned, then we can rely on automatic captions. Just one point. Um, uh, thanks, Cash. So uh, does anyone have thoughts on that? I can share mine, which is to, uh, to lean towards making these open and available just as we have the equity talks. I think that that's just being very clear about our intent from like doing these meetings in an open way. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm open to hearing other uh, uh, opinions here. And also Stacy, actually how you feel about not necessarily captioning uh, the recordings. Hi, this is Stacy. Um, I think it's important that we have a standard way to allow community members and participants of the meeting to request accessibility accommodations or uh, services for this meeting. But in the absence of that, I don't think we need to say have a live cart captioner or a, um, an ASL or BSL or other sort of sign language interpreter at this meeting, unless there's a specific request. Um, I do think though, that if we're going to put videos on YouTube and make them publicly available, that they should have appropriate captions. So I actually would argue for following our protocol of using the um, uh, three play media professional captions. Um, and I guess I'll just add my own personal take. Like, I think I appreciate the transparency that's happening here. And I think um, if we consistently provide it, that people will start to see its value <laughs> and, um, and that it, it will become more popular to pop into the meeting, watch the meeting or at least parts of it, et cetera. And so I guess I, I appreciate the that we're going to take some small number of resources and put it towards transparency of these meetings. 
Just a note about the public meetings and captioning. It's already a requirement that every public video on our channel is professionally or properly captioned. So um, there's no way out of that anyways. So if it's public, it needs to be properly captioned either by us or by Tripla Media. Thank you, Stacey, for weighing in. Any other thoughts? Also, any thoughts from um, folks from outside the AC who are here? Do you have preferences? OK, so no objections to having videos up uh, with captions. And that means agreement that we are uh, directing some resources to that exercise on a monthly basis. Stacy? Yeah, just out of curiosity, Cash, um, can you tell us about what an hour and a half long video in English is gonna cost you through 3 Play Media? Yeah, I don't think the money part is that much of an issue. I think one uh, um, each minute costs $2, two US dollars. So it's not that much about the money. It's just like, it's an added uh, pipeline of steps that needs to be taken because you send off the video for captioning, it takes one week and then um, you have to receive it back, download it and then upload it, so. Oh, I see. So it's a matter of like lag between the meeting and when it goes live and maybe a couple hundred bucks of captioning. Yeah, yeah, the money itself is very nominal, I would say. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there aren't any other questions or any other thoughts, and obviously feel free to bring this up uh, later or at any point uh, in chat or in the Q&A, but I think we can move forward to Andrew now, who's talking about the budget. Okay, thank you. So um, this is Andrew, uh, pronouns he, him. And let me share my screen. Um, okay. And with any luck, you can see it. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. So um, what I wanted to do is, is briefly give sort of a very, very broad overview of the entire budget process and where the budget sort of plays a role within Sakai. And I know that for some of you, this will be uh, repeating many things that or everything that you already know. So I apologize if you're in that group, but I thought that it's important for everybody to be on the same page. And so uh, that's why this, this presentation is a little, you know, perhaps broader than, than it's ideal for everybody in this meeting. But I just wanted to point one thing that I think we should all really take into account, which is that ultimately there is a single budget for SIGCHI. And I say this because in fact, there are so many different groups that make, make up SIGCHI. There are 24 sponsored conferences, there are chapters around the world, there are volunteers working throughout the world. There are, it's a worldwide community, right? But ultimately I think it's important to, for us all to acknowledge that in the end, it's a single budget. I sort of like to imagine it as, you know, one bank account managed by ACM and that's where the, you know, money comes from and that's where the money goes in. So I think that's something that I like to keep in mind that when I was uh, 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 vice president of conferences, this is one of the things that I always wanted to make sure that everybody who runs conferences knows because ultimately our individual successes are the success of the conference, but it's also ultimately the, the entire community that that is uh, part of this. And then another thing that I think is really important for us to recognize as we look at the Sikai budget and then every single sub budget, if you will, is that all of these budgets are plans in contrast to being specific contracts. So when we vote on a particular budget, we're coming up with a plan that will meet our goals. And, and we talked about many goals today uh, already. And at the same time, we have to realize that there is uncertainty. In fact, we recognize that because we just were slammed by the ultimate 
set of uncertainties in 2020. So I think this is another thing that is worth really taking into account. We're gonna look at the details of the budget, but it's still worth recognizing that uh, there is this one budget, but it's also a plan and not a contract. So if there's a particular number that you see in the budget, this is the plan, right? In contrast to saying this will be 100% absolutely what's going to happen as far as spending or, or as far as, or as revenues. And then the next step I think that's worth recognizing is that as we look at these budgets, uh, they, they seem really overwhelming because there's just a lot happening, but it's also good to know that ultimately it comes down to adding and subtracting. We have various sources of revenues and understanding these budgets comes down to understanding where the revenues come from. And then there are various expenditures. And again, you know, the, as, as you keep looking at the budgets, they become less and less complicated because you basically start recognizing where the money comes from and then where the money goes. There are a couple of other things that I wanted to mention. One is that as part of ACM, we're required to have a minimum balance in our overall single big sick high budget. So that's something that is perhaps worth keeping in mind. It's also worth keeping in mind that our, uh, you know, just like every corporation company, right? Uh, ACM also has a so-called fiscal year. So all of the calculations that pe people at the ACM do on an annual basis starts with July 1st as their fiscal year. And so now we're in fiscal year 2022. Having, having started in, on July 1st of this year. Okay, so I wanted to give you a quick overview of where we are for the 2022 budget, which was approved in April, I believe, by the previous executive committee. So these are projections again, right? So we're, we just started this fiscal year. So obviously this is far from fact, but our current projections are, are, are this, that as far as the revenues go, we expect to have about $115,000 in membership revenues. Uh, so this is people paying their, their annual membership to uh, SIGCHI. And then another source of revenue for every SIG, including ours, is uh, revenue from the ACM Digital Library. I must admit, I don't exactly know how this is calculated, but the fact is that as people download papers and, and read them, uh, Somehow, uh, there is a there is a an algorithm that assigns part of, of of the income that ACM generates from the digital library to our SIG, and that's around nine hundred thousand dollars projected for next year. And then, of course, our sponsored conferences, the twenty four conferences, uh, have a revenue, and that revenue comes from people paying their uh, fees for participating, or maybe it's for publication, and then uh, any money that that gets donated. Right, so anything that comes in as revenue to the conferences, and that's projected to be around $2.7 million. So the total revenues projected for 2022 are 3.8 million. Um, the projected expenditures are as follows. The sponsored conferences, of course, bring in money, but of course they spend practically all of that money, right? I mean, as, if you've looked at any budgets, you know, when people write, you know, create their conference budgets, they're intention is to be roughly a balanced budget. So that's where you see that sponsored conferences will spend about $2.2 .2 million of the money that they bring in. I put in there no overhead, and that's because I put separately the ACM overhead, which is a few lines down. And let's, let's talk about that in a moment. But in addition to the expenditures of the conferences, I pulled together community slash volunteer support. And I must admit that this is not a simple, this is truly not a single line. I will share the actual budget and you'll see that in fact, there are multiple things where, you know, this includes, for example, grants, a large amount of money is set aside for grants, uh, including both to the uh, conferences directly, as well as, you know, for example, people attend, trying to attend conferences and so forth for, for a whole host of different ways. Uh, there is money set aside for volunteer travel. And so there are many ways that, that we hope to support the community and support our volunteers. But that is a very sizable part of the, of the expenditures that we're looking at. Interaction is the magazine is roughly $130,000 to publish every year. And then a couple of other lines, ACM overhead. 
So of course, our colleagues at the ACM provide uh, a host of tremendous services. And one of them, in fact, is financing, right? So all of our conferences, if you ever run a conference that isn't sponsored by somewhere like ACM or IEEE, you know that to run a conference, you need startup money, right? You need to start putting money down for the hotel and, and do all of that is taken care of by the ACM, right? You can start pre-spending, for example, even before a single dollar comes into your conference from, from participation fees. And of course, all of the paperwork and dealing with the money coming in and, and going into and, and paying people, that all is taken care of by the ACM. So of course, there's a cost to that. There is a whole host of people, I think a lot of you know, have, and have worked directly with, with uh, colleagues at the ACM. And you know that costs money, and that's the 360,000 that we see. And then there are professional support functions, and I know that Cash knows a lot about these, right? So some of these are related to our website, and some of them are related to to getting support from registration to 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 working with Christie and so forth. So that is that is the approximately 800 thousand dollars. So the total projected for the next or this current fiscal year is 5.3 million. And so um, with that, uh, if my slide keeps moving, well, I don't know, hopefully it's gonna move to the next one, but um, let's see, how do I move? Oh, here we go, yay. Okay, well now it moved twice. So I'm gonna move back, here we go. So the balance uh, is of course the revenues uh, minus expenditures and our balance projected as a, a loss of 1.5 million for the coming fiscal year. And this was a decision that the previous uh, executive committee made because we felt that even though it looks like uh, revenues will be perhaps lower, we still want to make sure that, for example, the grants don't stop, that the support to the community doesn't vanish, that we can actually continue to do that, that the support that has to do with uh, maintaining our website doesn't disappear, right? So there are some things that we feel are important to keep uh, spending money on, and that's why you see this. At the same time, it's also important to note that uh, the ending balance next July is projected to be uh, $4.3 million, right? So we start out with a, a number in the bank account, and after we lose about 1.5 million projected, we would still be at 4.3 million at the end. So, uh, so that keeps us still in a healthy position. And as you look over the last uh, number of years, these things happen. Some years, you know, the SIG makes, uh, you know, a profit basically, there's, there's surplus, if you will, not a profit, but surplus, I should say. And then other years we have a loss. So these things even out over multiple years. And again, of course, that's this huge advantage of being part of the ACM, right? Because all these things are possible because we have this uh, behind us. And so uh, I wanted to remind you that the goals that, that I set out for myself and, and of course the, the executive committee shares, right? Is that one reason that is basically transparency, first of all, and then also understanding how each of us can play a role in influencing the budgets, right? So there is this high level, you know, here's where the budget is for the executive, uh, for the entire set guy, but then there are also a whole host of small pieces of that budget that people come in and, and make influences. And we also talked already about equity. So how do we make sure that our, our budgets actually support that? And then financial health. And hopefully you, you, are, uh, you feel that we are in a position where we do have financial health of the of sick guy. So let me spend a few minutes sharing uh, the current budget. And I'm gonna share the screen again. If anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to tell me. And I don't know if there are any comments in the chat. I didn't look at them. There are some comments in the chat. Maybe we can take them in the Q&A session. Uh, we're running a tiny bit short on time, um, but uh, go ahead and wrap up first, Andrew. Okay. So if you're on the executive committee, then you have access to uh, our, our, um, our budget that was voted on. And it's this big sheet that basically provides those numbers that I went over in this column C, right? So here's your 3.8 million in revenue and 
the 5.3 million in expenses, right? If you're on the executive committee, then you should start, if you haven't already looked at this, please reach out and I'm very happy to talk about this in detail with you. But at the bottom, you'll see tabs, executive committee, uh, EC, right? The entire EC has basically a whole, I think Neha, you mentioned this number of codes that are associated with, you know, what exactly does the EC want to accomplish? Well, there might be volunteer travel, which set aside $85,000 for the next fiscal year, right? Uh, CMC stand, turns out it stands for its conferences. I cannot remember what it actually originally stood for, but it's the VP conferences, right? Uh, community support has to do with uh, what Neha was involved in previously, which is uh, uh, grants to the community, publications and so forth. So let me not go over each of these, but please take a look and let's set additional time aside to make sure that we are, that everybody's okay with the individual lines. But you, what you will see basically is that common themes repeat. There will be uh, money set aside for volunteers, money set aside for travel, money set aside for certain professional functions. So let me stop here and then happy to talk about questions. Thank you, Andrew. Um, why don't we uh, ask people to just uh, add their questions uh, in the chat? And let's go ahead and have Olivia share um, their slides. I think, uh, would you like for Christy to share them or would you like to share them yourself? No, I can share them. Give me one second here. Great. So I'm okay. was given Perfect. five minutes, so I'm going to make this quick. Um, so committee on um, HCI education uh, has formally been formed in 2019, although we started working together um, in 2018 at CHI in Montreal. Um, I've been the chair for that committee uh, since its formation. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine extra members. So it's a 10 member committee, but we have nine people. And we try to recruit people from um, different places around the world uh, to have quite a, a broad representation of uh, different issues and um, concerns or uh, things that people may wanna bring to the table related to HCI education. So right now we have representative in Europe um, in India, Africa, and um, China as well. So I think one of the goal here is to target some of the key places where uh, HCI education is uh, a hot topic of discussion and bring these folks on board. So this is by no list, by no mean a complete list. It could be um, we're, well, we're open to take other members as well. And, um, add to our distribution of geographic locations. Okay, so um, we've basically been working on this idea of an, an HCI living curriculum, which was proposed by um, Elizabeth Churchill and Jenny Priest uh, in a 2014 CHI workshop. Um, we have a website that is live HCI living curriculum, and we have different events that we host on that website. So for example, we've done two last summer. Um, we've done the symposium again this year, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but in order to join our mailing list, Slack channel, um, and see what events we're doing within this community, this is the website to go to. We have a new mailing list, um, chi-education at acm.org or listserv at acm.org. And it's fairly well subscribed. Um, we have over 60 some odd members right now, but it's fairly new mailing list. Like it's um, the old mailing list was um, deleted. I think that it was Kai educators or something like that. And that was deleted and changed for Kai education. Our main presence right now is on our Facebook group, HCI education Facebook group. We have 405 members as of this August uh, on that community of practice. So all towards uh, building this kind of HCI curriculum. 
We've partnered with Engage CSEDU. I don't know if some of you know uh, Engage CSEDU, but it's a website that publishes material on CSC 101 type of content. Um, and by that, I mean online educational resources, OER. Um, there it's uh, resources related to um, materials for teaching and education. So we have a partnership with them now. And the goal is to open a special section of Engage CSEDU, which will be dedicated to HCI education. That way we can have a, a place to build a repository of HCI teaching online uh, resources. We have a uh, special edition of Frontiers in Computer Science that is coming on HCI education, uh, either December 2021 or January 2022. Uh, and there are several of our members are participating in that um, special issues on HCI education. And I think our main thing has been the EDUCAI workshop and symposium. Uh, we started with a workshop in Montreal in 2018 and we've ran uh, three symposia since then, 2019 in Glasgow and 2020 and 2021 online, obviously. But every year we see a, an increase in membership um, for these uh, symposium. We also see an increase in paper submissions. So this year we had over like 50 some odd submissions and we've accepted about like um, 16 or 17 submission in total. So um, we're really happy with this because um, we, we keep the momentum going and every year it's growing. So we're hoping to do it again in uh, 2022. Um, Short and long-term goals. Well, what we've been hearing a lot is uh, the need for translated uh, HCI education materials around the world. So different region of the world or, or wanting to have localized version of uh, an HCI curriculum or, um, uh, or asking about the sustainability of Western teaching with respect to other cultures, for example. So we've been hearing uh, a lot uh, of that in the past couple of years. So. Um, this is something I had started to work on with the previous um, Sikai president, but there might be um, something more to do here in terms of finding money to translate some materials and start some of these localized resources. Um, we would like to run an education summit at some point to invite uh, key people around the world to share their vision of HCI education. What do they need to make HCI education happen in their own part of the world? Um, and um, you know what 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 are what is what do they currently do and what's what's the gap type of thing right so um, so that that was a plan that we had before COVID um, and of course COVID slowed us down a little bit in uh, in that uh, education summit we would like to turn also Educai into a standalone conference eventually. So maybe do a one or two more year of a symposium within the CHI conference, but eventually we would like to go full blown standalone. So right now, like what, what we need is really like understanding the, the needs of local folks in their own communities. So which is why we, we try to sort of um, get our different members of the committee to kind of go into their community and see what is it that people need with respect to HCI education? What are the gaps? Um, the other thing that we want to be a, a little bit more proactive on, I should say, is anything HCI education event opportunities, materials that we can actually promote. And so I know like different part of the world, different institute, uh, different universities or colleges around the world, they run these like sort of HCI summer school or they have like mini conferences and things like that. So related to HCI education, we would like to be more of a catalyst to, to promote some of these events and opportunities. So, um, yeah, we, we really need some help to make EDUCAI bigger. So that's what I'm hoping we'll be able to achieve in the next year or two. Uh, we need to start looking at what is required to, um, in terms of resources, financially, or even like human resources to start localizing some HCI teaching material. And we keep, we keep building the repository. So hopefully with uh, C Engage CSEDU, we're gonna have a very strong partnership in the next year or so. 
um, and then we will be able to capitalize on this. But there might be some resources needed too in there because they may ask for our support to, um, to go into their uh, sort of repo and website. So that's what I have in a few minutes. And if there are any questions, I'm willing to take any questions, of course. Thank you so much, Olivier. I don't know if there are questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I just wanted to also mention that Adriana, Olivier, and uh, I, we had met a little while back to just kind of uh, get the lay of the land, understand what this space is about, what we could be doing with regards to chapters and uh, just even other uh, local communities. So in regards to that, I don't know, Adriana, do, do you want to add anything um, from your perspective? Okay. So um, we're good. <laughs> okay. And, and this is something we will be following up on. We just um, appointed our VP chapters last week. Uh, he's not here, but um, I think this is something that we want to also involve him in. So with that, I think that brings us to the, I mean, you can please continue to take questions and uh, address them in the chat. Um, I had a few updates that I wanted to um, go over in the last couple of minutes. I'll do that very quickly. So there's the open calls that are open now and closing on the 20. 7th of, of August, so the Friday of next week. So please, um, if you'd like to apply, if you have questions about these roles, uh, let us know. Um, and then we're also going to be doing an open call for volunteering, which is much more general, but basically for our committees, for our um, regional um, focus areas, and then also for just particular tasks like website updates or maybe design activities and, and such. So that's a call that um, Naomi has been helping with and we should probably have something out in the next uh, couple of weeks. And um, uh, one thing with regards to our regional focus areas I wanted to mention is that Adriana and I have been speaking with a few people from Southern Europe so just like we uh, set up the Latin America committee, our hope is that we can um, uh, start or restart some of the conversations that have been happening in Southern Europe, um, around Italy, uh, Portugal, Greece. Um, and so there's quite a few people who have expressed interest in that and have been uh, meeting. And so if you'd like to know more, let Adriana or me know. Um, uh, we had a, we had something come up with regards to doing demographic surveys at conferences, and this has been, you know, a couple of people have asked us uh, about the best way to do these surveys, and if there are examples that we could use. And here I wanted to ask if any of you have recommendations. So I did reach out to the CHI organizing committee from last year, um, and um, I, th I think we had a conversation about this on. Um, on Slack earlier, but is there anything that comes to mind for people here, like in terms of good ways of, of uh, getting demographic information that they have seen? Okay. Well, uh, so this is probably something we'll have to give some guidance on because the, uh, the example that this group was using, we had some issues with because of the way that certain questions were phrased. So um, this is actually for WIST, which is I think happening in October. So they wanted to do the survey September or so. Um, okay. So that's something that, that is on our plate. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is awards. So um, the awards timeline, obviously we're, we're tied to that. November is when we're gonna have the first deadline, hopefully the only deadline, but just making sure that in case we need to do an extension, we have some room for that. So uh, wait, Josh, I think it's the 1st of December that we decided, right, would be the deadline? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So 1st December, and uh, that means that all of the work that we want to do beforehand in terms of just making sure that the committees are in place, making sure that we're, we have a plan for outreach, so working with, with communications on that, um, making sure that uh, we're thinking through some of the additional questions around like different awards, because ACM has just 
uh, put out some information about how they're doing awards. And so I'll share that with the rest of DC. I just got this email last night, uh, to, uh, which was sent out to ACM key people um, and shared, uh, I don't know who key people are, but basically people in the ACM community to encourage them to do nominations for awards. Um, so if you have any thoughts on awards, please send them to Josh. Uh, we're also planning to do a brainstorming session with the community in September. So after the Kai deadline, but hopefully early enough so that we can um, just see what we could do in terms of you know, ensuring transparency and equity and outreach, uh, making sure that we're, we're doing as much as possible. And then also recognizing that we may not be able to completely transform the awards process this year, um, but we have uh, a plan for doing um, doing things differently year by year so that we, we address some of the issues that have been coming up repeatedly. Okay. Um, with that, uh, we are at the end of our time, but are there any, any questions that we wanna discuss before? Uh, I see Stacy, you have a question about uh, the wording. So, um, I think that AC Equity would be a good person to take that on, but we don't have, uh, uh, we're in the middle of, of doing that appointment, right? So uh, if, there, if there are any volunteers for taking charge of this item, then that would be great. This is Stacy. I think it's so important and it does need someone to carefully lead it, but I have no bandwidth. Uh, maybe what we do for WIST is we share with them the resources we have <laughs> and say good luck. <laughs> and then we make a more dedicated effort once the AC equity is on board, unless anyone else is like really passionate about this and has the bandwidth. Yeah, actually, I see Finda is here, and I know this is something that came up in the recent SIGCHI talk as well, right, how we collect data and how we want to do it kind of sensitively. So I don't know, Finda, if you have any thoughts on this, but I could follow up with you and see, like, this is basically around asking questions around, um, like, just four or five questions that we would ask around uh, uh, demographics. Yeah. Um... I think the only question I had for you all, um, and I agree it's more of a bandwidth thing for me too, is um, is like what kind of answers or questions are you all trying to collect? So um, I'm sure like one question you might be like, what regions are our members from? Um, and you probably want to dig deeper. So maybe start from there of like, what kind of, I guess support is questions that you're trying to answer from the data in order to kind of develop the questions further. So I'm sure you're gonna be like, what geographic regions? And then you'll probably like drill down, drill down, drill down to be like, you know, what particular like identities, you know, and also, you know, I think I mentioned it in our in our Slack channel, just being aware that people, you know, have multicultural identities and so kind of being able to collect that. So um, for me, it's more bandwidth, but um, just being mindful of like, what, what kind of information are you trying to draw from this? I wonder if this also aligns well with what we're trying to do with awards, Josh. What are your thoughts on that? Because we talked about that paper, right, that had come up in the equity talk, um, and that might be uh, aligned with what we're trying to do. And Vinda, this is the paper that Adria had shared, if you remember. Um, it was uh, it was about kind of looking through different equity dimensions for awards. Mm -hmm. So the paper actually in page four makes a few recommendations to create more inclusive environments. And, and I think there are a couple of different things there, right? Because that paper could be applied to how we organize the awards and how do we promote the, the inclusivity of people. But actually, just to go back to the point of the demographic information that we collect, another thing to consider is how do you tell people why you are collecting certain information, right? So it's not only thinking about what information we want to collect, but how do we tell them why we are collecting that information so people are comfortable about sharing that information? Yeah, I just shared a link to the paper. Um, 
So maybe this is something that we could try to figure out for this survey and then use uh, as we move forward with awards. I don't know, that's, that's a thought. Josh, what do you think? I'm thinking about the, um, looking at the submittable forms. And if we are saying that one of the goals is thinking about the participation of underrepresented areas of the world, we need to be able to capture what those areas are. And we might not necessarily need to specifically pick up demographic information. It might be just where the university is located, for example, or the institution. And that might give us that place in the map according to, to the awards. So I'm trying, as, as I'm speaking, thinking about what is the demographic information that we actually need from the different awards and how do we then think about underrepresented areas of the world when we think about awards. So I think there, there are a couple of different things there. So one is that survey that um, I don't have all the context about and the other one is what are all the different things that we can do in awards to then ensure that we have that representation that is brought. So um, thank you uh, and thank you, Finda. I think what we'll do, I'll, I'll quickly follow up uh, with you both and whatever resources we can offer to the group, we'll do that for now. And we'll say that once we have NAC for equity, which will be soon, we'll be working uh, on something like this so that other conferences can use it. It's not going to be very useful for WIST because WIST will happen, I think, just around that time. But uh, in future conferences, we can probably try to uh, do that. How does that sound for a plan? Okay, so I think we're over. Thank you everybody uh, for attending. We're gonna go into the working session, which is closed. So um, we're gonna stop recording and thank you everyone who joined us from outside of EC. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay.